Welcome to our video on sizing members in steel double angle trusses. The most common form of steel truss that we use involves double angles for at least the top and bottom cord and uh, often for web members particularly in heavily loaded steel trusses such as steel girder trusses. In the process, we're going to define first, first we're going to define the geometry of the truss. Then we're going to find the forces on the vertices of the truss based on the presumed load on the truss. Then we're going to find the axial forces in the truss members. And finally, we're going to size the truss members using tables for design strength and axial compression. Um, we encounter tables like this when we were sizing columns in steel pipe, hollow steel sections, and wide flange columns. We have similar tables for double angles and we're going to use that to do a preliminary sizing of the truss elements. As we will learn, um, often the web members may be solid rods or they may be single angles, but for the purpose of this particular exercise we're going to be a little quick and dirty and we're going to assume that all the members in the truss are double angles and then we'll talk about what the implications are um, if they aren't. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do is define the geometry of the truss. In this case we're going to look at a truss that's 60 feet long and that has a depth of 3 feet so it's basically a truss that has a depth that is 1 20th of the length. So it's kind of uh, common uh, proportions for a truss. In this case we're going to assume square bays. Um, we could have assumed a Warren truss or anything else, but the key thing is to know that for the purposes of this exercise these are square bays. The second step in the process is to find the forces on the vertices of the truss and here's what we're going to assume. We're going to assume the spacing of the trusses is five feet. We're going to assume that the dimension from one node or one vertex to the next is three feet. So we have a, an image here that says that node right there is supporting halfway to the next truss on this side and halfway to the next truss on that side and halfway to the next node there and halfway to the next node here. So in other words, the area of floor that's associated with this particular vertex is a patch of floor that's three feet by five feet. Or in other words, 15 square feet of floor area per vertex on that truss. All right, so here we have a summary chart that says we're looking at a three foot deep truss we're going to assume a dead load of 53 pounds per square foot. This is the weight of the decking, which would be six inch thick lightweight decking on a two inch corrugated steel deck, or that comes out to 0.053 kips per square foot. We're going to assume a live load of 100 pounds per square foot, or in other words, 0.1 kips per square foot. We've already said the node to node spacing is three feet. The truss to truss spacing is five feet. The floor area associated with a single node we just calculated to be 15 square feet. So if we want the P dead and P by the way, this is uppercase P meaning it's the point force on the vertex is going to equal the area distributed load which is 0 .5, 0 0.053 kips per square foot. It's that times the area, which is 15 square feet. So 15 times 0 .053 is 0 0.795 kips total on the joint associated with the dead load of the decking. Then the live load is going to be 0 0.1 kips per square foot times 15 square feet or in other words, 1.5 kips total. 
And then we're going to have a total factored load, which is 1.2 times P dead plus 1.6 times P live. And when we multiply 1.2 times this and add that to 1.6 times that, we get 3.35 kips of total factored load on the truss. And by the way, I'm calling this P1, and we've shown it as P1 in this image. I'm doing that because we're going to look at two trusses, one of which is three feet deep, and the other is twice that depth, or six feet. And uh, it'll have a different node spacing, and therefore a different force on each of the nodes or vertices in the truss. And again, I'll remind you that node, vertex, joint, and panel point are all terms that are used for a joint in a truss. Okay, so we know what the forces are on the vertices, and we've already ascertained it's 3.35 uh, kips. But we're going to do our calculations in terms of the symbol P1, until we get things distilled down and then we'll multiply in this 3.35. Uh, that way we have a more general formula that could apply regardless of what load we have on the vertices. Um, but also it just keeps the uh, arithmetic simpler. So now we're going to use the principles of equilibrium and action-reaction pairs to find the forces in the truss members. So here we see an image of the truss. It's a 20 bay truss with a P1 force on all the interior vertices and a 0.5 P1 force at the end vertices because they're only supporting half a bay. Uh, we have 20 bays. Each bay has a force P1 associated with it. So the reactions are 10 P1 at each end. Now we've cordoned off the end here to look at and we've done that because we want to size some web members and we know that the web members at the end are the most heavily loaded because the webs have to account for shear and the shear force is largest near the end. So relative to web members, we go straight to the end to find out our sort of worst case condition. And at the end, we have this 10P reaction, the 0.5P1 force on this joint and a P1 force on that joint. And when we resolve the forces at this location, we see we have a 10 P1 force up, a 0.5 P1 force down, or a, a net of 9.5 P1 upward. This tension member right here uh, has to create a vertical downward component of 9.5 P1 to keep that joint in equilibrium because these are all square bays, basically. The slope of this is at 45 degrees. The vertical and horizontal components have to be the same. And when we resolve them, we get a, an overall tension force in this diagonal of 13.4 P1. Then when we go to this joint, we see that the vertical component of this member is pulling up on that joint with a 9.5 P1 force. So this member must be pushing down on that joint with that force. So in other words, it's a 9.5 P1 force in compression. This is our worst compression web. This is our worst tensile web. And we're going to use these numbers to size those. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to summarize our information. We've already said that the P force P1 is equal to 3.35 kips. We calculated that already. We know that we have a multiplier of 9.5 P1 to get the compression force in this vertical member. So we have 9.5 times 3.35 because that's what P1 is. So we have 9.5 times P1, or in other words, 9.5 times 3.35 gives us 31.9 kips of compressive force in the most heavily loaded vertical web member. Now if we go back, we see we have a multiplier of 13.4 times P1 for the tension member. So we have 13.4 times 3.35.
and that comes out to 44.9 and I've put a minus on this to remind us that it's in tension and so this number is in, is positive meaning it's in compression this is negative meaning it's in tension and I'm also color coding everything by surrounding um, the compressive information in red and anything that's in tension is in blue. Now we want to go find the chord forces and instead of going to the end we're going to go to the middle because this is probably going to be a continuous member 60 feet long and we're going to size it based on the worst chord force which is going to occur at the center. So we take a free body by slicing through this bay and that leaves us with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine P1 forces that are centered in this location. So I replace all of those P1 forces with a nine P1 force right there. And then I take this 10 P1 and this 0.5 P1 and I combine them together to produce a 9.5 P1 force. Um, as the net force on the end. Now we're going to take moments about point Q here. Uh, so the sum of the moments about Q is equal to zero. So we say zero is the end result of all this and relative to that point this T1 force is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment. So I put a minus on it. I put the magnitude of the force and then I put the lever arm for that force, so relative to this point Q, the perpendicular distance to the line of action of T is basically uh, this dimension right here. Which is uh, 3 feet. Then relative to that point, I have a 9P1 force which is tending to create counterclockwise motion around Q. So I'm going to put minus 9P1 and then the lever arm is 4 bays times 3 foot per bay. And then I have this force creating a clockwise moment about that point. So it's 9.5P1 times its lever arm which is 9 bays relative to point Q with 3 feet per bay. And when I run all these numbers, I come up with T is plus 49.5 P1, the plus sign meaning, yes, it's actually in the direction that was assumed. Now I'm going to add a second point, which is this point right here. It's uh, point S. If I can mark that without making a mess. I don't think I can. <laughs> but if I take moments about that and set it equal to zero, C1 is tending to create a counterclockwise motion about that point. So I'm going to make it negative minus C1 times this lever arm which is the perpendicular distance from the point S to the line of action of the force C which happens to be three feet. Then I have my 9P1 force, which is tending to produce a counterclockwise motion. So it's tending to rotate in this direction. So I put a minus 9P1 times this lever arm, which is five bays times three feet. And then finally, I have this 9.5P1 force, which is 10 bays, and it's tending to produce a clockwise motion about point S. So I have plus 9.5 P1 times 10 bays times 3 feet per bay. And when I work all that out, C1 comes out to be 50.0 P1 and the plus sign means that it's actually in the direction that we drew it in. So when I go to summarize that information, um,
Well, let me get control of uh, things here. I don't know what I'm doing anymore, but I want to turn that off. Okay. So we have a factor of 50 that was from this diagram. So we've got 50p and 49. So let me go forward. I've got a factor of 50 times 3.35 is 167.7. And for the tension, we had a factor of 49.5. And that gives us 49.5 times 3.35 gives us 166.0. And again, I put a minus sign on it just to make sure that we have every possible reminder that this is a tension force. So what you'll notice is the, the most lightly loaded members are the vertical webs followed by the diagonals. And then the really heavily loaded members are the cord members, which doesn't surprise us because we understand that the lever arm effects are such that those cord members are going to be subjected to fairly substantial forces. Okay, so step four will be to use tables for design strength in axial compression. Again, these are the tables that you use to size columns except now we're going to use them to size the axial members in this truss. And we're going to do, we're going to use tables for double angles. We're also going to use 36 KSI steel because those are the only tables that have been included recent, in recent years in the steel manual. Um, when we go to look at standardized trusses, they're almost all going to be in 50 KSI steel. So we'll have to fudge some numbers to make these comparisons. But for the moment, we're looking at 36 KSI steel double angles for this truss. Okay, so again, the summary of information is for our three foot deep truss, um, our forces are compression in the vertical web, tension in the diagonal web, compression in the top cord, and tension in the bottom cord. And um, by the way, the webs are highly variable and can be varied and will typically be varied. So when we size the webs for these worst cases, we understand that we're being a little on the conservative side but we don't want to go through and size every web member because then this exercise will become really elaborate and involved. So we're going to size the end webs and estimate the weight of the truss based on those fairly conservative numbers. Now we're going to take these numbers and we're going to put them into a different table and that looks something like that. So the numbers we just talked about are this number right here and that one right there and that one and that one. And then I've written under that the effective length because understanding the effective length when we go into the tables is crucial because this member is in compression and is three feet long. Its effective length is three feet because this member is in tension as indicated by that minus sign. Um, it is not subject to buckling and therefore its length is not a significant factor. So in fact, when we go into the tables for axial compressive strength, we're going to look at a member of effective length zero because that's the member that's going to be governed strictly by yield stress and not by buckling. So that table allows us to design just as a lookup number for a tension member. So we're going to put effective length in this case is zero. Um, for the top cord in compression, the effective length again is three feet. That's also the actual length of that member. And then for the bottom cord, the effective length is zero. So we're going to go into our tables and try to size some members. And I've already filled out this table here, but we're going to go look for something. Uh, and we're going to start off uh, working on this vertical web here. 
Um, and so uh, the axial compressive force we're trying to design for is 31.9 kips at an effective length of three feet. This is what the table looks like. Um, this is design strength and axial compression for equal leg double angles. You'll notice over here it says effective length with respect to the indicated axis and that's what this portion of the chart is about. That and that. And you'll notice this is for buckling about the XX axis which is this axis right now here there. So in other words that's for the top quarter galloping up and down or uh, failure in that direction. Um, we can also have a failure about the YY axis. When you look in this table though you'll discover that the, um, the members are all stronger relative to that. So we basically can ignore this part of the table and that's particularly true for top cords where we're going to weld the decking down every six inches or so um, or every at least every 12 inches so the effective length uh, relative to buckling about the YY axis which is lateral or sideways buckling of the top cord the effective length for that is only a foot so we basically can ignore this part of the table so we're going to focus on the top part and we're going to zoom in a little closer um, so we can see it and we were told that we were looking for 31.9 so when we come into this table we discover that a 2 by 2 by 1 8 um, won't do it um, at an effective length of 3 feet so let me stop a moment here because my diagram has gotten kind of messed up and I want to discard those annotations and I'm going to pull this down to right here and now we're going to go back and I hope I got that right uh, according to this uh, at an effective length of three feet in compression um, a two by two by one eighth won't work a two by two by three sixteenths will and it weighs 4.91 uh, pounds per foot so when I come here I'm going to write two by two by three sixteenths with a weight of 4.91 pounds per foot and this is what the table says it can endure um, that's its design axial strength this is the load we were trying to design to so we've got that member taken care of and now we can go on to our diagonal web it has to resist a tensile force of 44.9 so its effective length is zero in our in our column buckling or our compression table so we're going to go look at that and what we're going to see is 44.9 this one doesn't quite work this one does however this one does also and this one is lighter than that one so we're going to say a two and a half by two and a half uh, weighing 6.13 pounds per foot or excuse me two and a half by two and a half by three sixteenths weighs 6.13 pounds per foot and has this design axial strength so when we go into our table we write double angle which is 2L this L standing the letter symbol for angle um, so again a double angle two and a half by two and a half by three sixteenths has a tensile capacity of 54.1 kips and it weighs 6.13 um, pounds per foot so now we want to go size the top cord in compression 167.7 kips of axial compression an effective length of three um, let me go back 167.7 and at at uh, three feet you'll notice this is a little annoying table they give two and four and we have to interpolate between we're at three so we'll be halfway
between whatever numbers we have here. So halfway between 161 and 171 is 166, which is almost works because we're looking for 167.7, but it doesn't work. So this member does not work, but when we interpolate here, we discover that halfway between that and that is 192, which works. And so we're going to go with a four a double angle, four by four by seven sixteenths, which weighs 22.5 pounds per foot. So 22.5 here is the weight and the designation is double angle four by four by seven sixteenths, which has an axial design axial uh, strength of 192 kips. So now we're ready finally to size the bottom cord. Um, we're trying to handle 166 kips of force. In other words, 166,000 pounds. Effective length is zero. So again, we're here where the effective length is zero. And we're looking for, let me go back, 166. And this one works. It's a three by three by one half, uh, and it weighs 18.7 pounds per foot. So um, that's this right here, double angle three by three by one half, weighing 18.7 pounds per foot. Now in this table, I've written the number of various members, like there are 19 vertical webs and they are three feet long. So there's 57 feet of those. If we multiply 57 feet times 4.91 pounds per foot, we discover we have 280 pounds of vertical webs. If we do simple, similar arithmetic, we can get the diagonals. It turns out there are 20 diagonals um, weighing 6.13 pounds per foot. So we end up um, with uh, a total um, weight, or let's see, we have 20 of those so we have a total, oh, and each of those is 4.24 feet long because it's a diagonal member. So when we multiply that times the number times the weight per foot, we get 520 pounds. And similarly, we can do this for the web, for, excuse me, for the uh, top cord and the bottom cord. And when we add all those together, this truss weighs uh, 3,272 pounds. Um, and we ran a couple of numbers here. One is the weight per foot, which is that number divided by the 60 feet of length. And the other number we ran is we said this truss is supporting 300 square feet of floor, so it weighs 10.9 pounds per square foot. Okay, so that's the summary of all the data for this three foot deep truss. Now we're gonna repeat all this. We're gonna double the depth of the truss and go to six feet, which by the way, um, the proportions of this will be L over 10 because it's spanning 60 feet and it's six feet deep. So this is an unusually deep truss and we don't tend to see this in our guidelines, but we're gonna run the numbers here because it's pretty informative. It's gonna tell us something uh, important. So first we'll define the geometry. As I just mentioned, it's six feet deep. It's spanning 60 feet long. Then we're gonna find the forces on the vertices of the truss. Uh, each of these trusses is supporting a swash of floor that's five feet wide and six feet in the other direction because the spacing of the vertices is now six feet and so from one vertex to the other is uh, halfway is three feet that way and halfway to the next vertex is three that way. So we have a total of six feet in this direction and then we go halfway to the next truss and halfway to the next truss, which is a total width of five feet. So we're supporting 30 square feet of floor per vertex and we're going to designate that net force with the symbol P2, and we needed to put a P2 on it because we had a P1 for the three foot deep truss. So we run these numbers again. We have the same load, dead load, the same live load. We now have a different node spacing and twice the square foot of floor area per vertex. 
And when we run all these numbers, we get a dead load, I mean, excuse me, a total factored load of 6.71 kips. And that's twice what we got for the previous problem, which is not too surprising because the only thing we really changed here was the node to node spacing, which is causing each vertex, the vertices are twice as far apart, which means they're responsible for twice as much floor area, and that in turn means twice as much load. So step three, we use the principles of equilibrium and action-reaction pairs to find the forces in the truss members. Again, we go to the end and we resolve the forces to find out the most severely loaded tension diagonal, or excuse me, diagonal, which is uh, basically this one right here, and the most severely loaded uh, compression member, which is right there. And we come up with these factors of 4.5 times P2 for the compression in that member and 6.36 P2 for the tension in this member. And uh, we'll just run through this. Um, when we take a free body slicing through here to find chord forces, we apply the force C2 and T2. And again, we'll take moments about point Q to get T2 and all the mathematics of that is run here and we end up with, this should have said uh, T1. So I'm gonna go back and correct that and I apologize for spending time doing that, but um, this is what happens every time when I copy something and I don't make all the corrections. Okay, so um, we have T2 is equal to 12 P2. And now I'm going to have to do that again. Um, And this should be C2. Wow. Might want to proof this someday. All right. So we get, in the case of the six foot deep truss, we get um, C2 is 12.5 P2. So now we can use our tables. And again, we're going to start looking at the vertical web, but we've summarized all of our forces. So <clears throat> the compressive force in the vertical web turns out to be 30.2. Um, and let me just see. So let me go back and uh, summarize some things really quickly. Um, for the six foot deep truss, we came up with these proportions on the, ten, on the web members of a multiplier of 4.5 times P2 for the compression member and 6.36P uh, as a multiplier of P2 for the tension member. So I've written those uh, factors here. 4.5 is the factor for the vertical web member. Uh, P2 was 6.71, so when we multiply those together, we get uh, 30.2 kips. Um, the multiplier for the diagonal was 6.36 P2. So when I put that in here, I get 6.36 times 6.71 is 42.7. And I've put a minus sign on top of it to remind us that it's tension. And also, I've put red around these to remind us that this is compression. Blue is for tension. So we went through and we found a multiplier of 12 for the bottom chord force times P2 and a multiplier times P2 of 12.5 for the top chord force. And those get summarized here. 12.5 times 6.71 is 83.9 kips 
and the multiplier of 12 for the tension force times 6.75 is minus 80.5. All right, now we're ready to use the tables. And we've organized the information again where the compressive force that the vertical web has to deal with is right here. So again, that was 30.2. The tensile force for the diagonal web is right there. That came from right here. Um, and then we have 83.9 as the compression force on the top cord, and then 80.5 as the tensile force on the bottom cord. So all that's been summarized along here. The effective length is six feet for the vertical web because the truss is six feet deep. It's six feet for the top cord because it's six feet from vertex to vertex. It's zero though for any member that's in tension like the diagonal web or the bottom cord. So now we can go onto our tables. We're looking for something at an effective length of six feet that has a design strength in axial compression of uh, at least 30.2 kips. So when we go there, we come up with this at an effective length of six feet um, this is the lightest member. Um, down here, this member works, um, but it's heavier. So a two and a half by two and a half by uh, three sixteenths weighing 6.13 pounds. So that's been written in here. The weight per foot is 6.13. This is the axial, uh, the design axial strength for this member. And the member is a two and a half by two and a half by three sixteenths. So now we go size the diagonal web. It's got a tension force of 42.7 and an effective length of zero in this table. And when we come here, we see 44.1 works. That's a double angle two by two by three sixteenths weighing 4.91 pounds per foot. So I put that number right here and that allows us to calculate the total weight of these types of members. Now we can go here to the top cord. It has a compressive force of 83.9 kips, an effective length of six feet. So when we go on the table, we discover at an effective length of six feet, uh, a three by three by five sixteenths doesn't work, but a three by three by three eighths does. This is larger. Um, this weighs 14.3 pounds. And by the way, I also noted that a three and a half by three and a half by five sixteenths also has the same weight and also works. But for what we're put working on here, we're just trying to estimate the total weight of the truss. Uh, it doesn't make any difference which of these two we pick. So in the table, I put a double angle three by three by three eighths. So here we have double angle three by three by three eighths uh, with a weight of 14.3 pounds per foot and able to safely sustain an axial compressive force of 92.9 kips at an effective length of six feet. And this 92.9 is greater than the design force that we uh, were trying to satisfy. Finally, for the bottom cord, we have a tensile force of 80.5. Um, in the table, we'll be looking at an effective length of zero. Um, and when we come here, we see a two by two by three eighths works. This is more than 80.5 at an effective length of zero, and it weighs 9.3 pounds per foot. So we put that there. And again, we multiply the weight per foot times the number of members times the length of the member in feet. Um, and when we multiply all that together, we end up with 331 pounds of vertical webs, 416 pounds of diagonal webs, 858 pounds of top cord, and 558 pounds of bottom cord. And when we summarize all that um, and make comparisons, you'll discover that um, the amount of 
vertical web has increased and that's not surprising when we go from the three foot deep truss to the six foot deep truss we've increased the amount of material in the vertical webs and the reason for that is being six feet long instead of three feet and being in compression they're more vulnerable to buckling so de increasing the depth of the truss has hurt us in this particular category in this category it actually helped us slightly and um, and that may be um, just due to uh, sort of quantum jumps in the cross-sectional areas of members that are available um, and then the really big differences though this is sort of a wash relative to um, the comparisons this number has gone down a little bit this number went up a little bit but on total there's very little change there what has changed dramatically is the top cord member is much lighter and the bottom cord member is even more light uh, or essentially half the cross-sectional area and and because the top and bottom cords represents the lion's share of the weight we're actually discovering that this six foot deep version of the truss is weighing substantially less in terms of pounds per foot so this may be puzzling to you um, because um, basically your guidelines don't ever recommend trusses as deep as L over 10. And to understand this, you should understand that this deep proportion to the truss is actually structurally logical. Um, but in most situations, the deeper you make a truss, the taller your building has to be. That means the more wind load you have, the more overturning moment, um, the more surface of the building that you're paying for. So the guidelines are based on, on notions of um, common economic limitations. And as a consequence, we don't put within those guidelines anything as deep as L over 10. But there are situations where it can occur. For example, uh, some restaurants have pretty high ceilings because they want um, the odors of all the food and whatnot to go up to the ceiling and then they basically siphon off the air at that point. So a higher ceiling gives fresher air in the restaurant. If you have a high ceiling and then you have a bunch of dinky little trusses up there, they don't really look very good. They look kind of chinchy. So sometimes you'd rather have a deeper truss and then the truss becomes a sort of sculptural element in the space. And there are a fair number of types of spaces where the height of the space is not a particularly limiting factor. So you shouldn't rule out the idea of using trusses that have proportions uh, of L over 10. Um, and, and this analysis we've just done has indicated that, in fact, from a pure structural point of view, uh, that represents the logical thing to do. Okay, so we've compared the weights of, of two different depths of trusses or two different proportions and generally demonstrated that deeper proportions are more economically logical, and we kind of knew that all along, but we made it more quantitative in this particular example. Uh, one of the things we're going to be doing soon is comparing the weight of trusses sized by this method to standard steel trusses that you're going to select from tables. And by the way, uh, for a little dinky truss like this 60 foot long truss, uh, not only will you not size the truss, but your engineer won't. Um, and that'll be a topic of subsequent uh, videos. But basically, almost all double angle steel trusses in this country are now manufactured by specialists. They have computer software. Um, and basically you send them a uh, drawing of the, of the truss that you want in terms of what is the span, what's the depth, what are the loads on it, and they will not only size all the web members and the cord members, but they will size all the welds on it, they'll manufacture it for you, 
and they will deliver it to you at a really reasonable price. And so there's no logic whatsoever uh, for an engineer to do those calculations given that someone at that trust manufacturer um, has the software and has the expertise and, and it's better to turn that responsibility over to them because then they will warrant that product for whatever span and depth and load that you prescribed. That ends our video on sizing members in steel double angle trusses.